He's Howard Ibach, a former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 28 years of experience. Together, Henry and I are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. Henry, today we have a young woman who is a dynamite uh, TikToker. I guess that's what we would call her. Her name is Ashley Rutstein. She has a website and a TikTok page called Stuff About Advertising. She's a freelance advertising copywriter, and she's going to tell us her story. It's a great conversation. Let's join it. We are back for another episode, and we are in, in, joined today by Ashley Rutstein. And she came to my attention, as always, on LinkedIn. She is a freelance copywriter who also has a TikTok page. Okay, no, that's no big deal. Everybody's got a TikTok page these days. But when I had a conversation with her before we started, you know, doing this episode, I learned some interesting things, and we're going to talk about that today. But first, let me just say, welcome, Ashley. Henry and I are delighted to have you on The Brief Brothers. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. I, I think when we first talked, I was like, you know, this is so cool that you're just talking about briefs. It's such an untapped conversation, and it it's crazy that you can make so much content out of briefs, but you really can. You can just talk about them forever. <laughs> Three years plus. Yeah. 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 I, don't, I don't know. We've, we've learned. <laughs> we have a lot of filler. <laughs> yeah. We've, we've learned to talk about other things, but you know, everything is connected in one way or another to the brief. We all lament a bad brief. We all mm -hmm. remember the handful of good briefs. We all, know what happens when we get a good brief. Um, it's one of those things that we talk about without, we take it for granted. So it's it's fun to bring on strategists and copywriters and art directors and marketing people and get their takes on it. And what, what attracted me to you and why I think you're a great fit for our show is because, well, first of all, you're a freelance copywriter. So you and I have a little simpatico there. Henry's the strategist. I'm the former creative. You know, I did a lot of copywriting in my day. You have found a nice niche and a nice home on TikTok. And as I said before, lots of people are on TikTok. It's nothing new. What's new, I think, and what I want you to talk about um, is why are there not more creatives working on TikTok doing that? So I want you to get to that, definitely. But first, I want you to just tell us a little bit about, you know, you look like a relatively young person um, and you're out freelancing already. So that tells me that you've had an interesting career so far. Tell us about how you got to advertising, what attracted you to advertising, and then a little bit about your trajectory to where you are today. Yeah, I mean, it's been a wild ride. I, I appreciate you saying that I look relatively young. I feel like I've been noticing wrinkles lately and it's driving me crazy. <laughs> um, but so I... I was actually a chemistry major in college uh, for the first two years because I thought I wanted to be a pharmacist and organic chemistry knocked me right out of that. <laughs> <laughs> I immediately realized that that was not for me. And at the time I had a YouTube channel where I was just making fun, silly skits and, and rants and, you know, fun videos just for myself. And I loved making content. It was so much fun. I was obsessed with YouTube and social media. This was like right when social media was really taking off. So I found myself in a different major, which was called uh, information communication technology, which was basically half IT, half communication. So it really focused on digital marketing. And, and the fact that social media was really emerging back then, it made it so exciting. I looked at the course list and just was enamored. Um, and immediately I found myself in an internship at a local agency doing social media. And because social media was so new back then, the social team was in the basement. We were kind of left to our own devices. Uh, we did everything, copywriting, art direction, design, talk to clients. We did analytics. I mean, we did everything. And I worked my way up to a management position um, on that team and so just in a couple years, I had a ton of experience because I was doing everything and it, we were very understaffed. <laughs> so I think I, I got kind of jaded pretty quickly in my career because I just went through so much right at the beginning. Um, but because of that, I had so much experience under my belt and I had all different departments that were interesting to me. And I, I wanted to figure out what I wanted to do next. 
I did a little internship with analytics because I thought I wanted to do that. Again, quickly realized that that's not for me. I need something creative. So I worked my way into a copywriting internship and went from there. I just absolutely love writing, which is weird because I hated writing in school. <laughs> um, but it's a very different kind of writing, as you know. And yes, um, definitely. yeah, just worked my way up to, to creative director. And I shortly after becoming creative director just needed a, a life change. I was working very long hours. I was finding myself getting mentally drained too often. And I just knew I needed to do something different. So I decided to just go out on my own and become a freelancer. And that's that was three years ago now. Well, you know, Henry and I have heard stories from a lot of different people, creative strategists and so on. And the one there seems to be a common thread that a lot of us were doing something else. Henry, mm -hmm. Henry was, I think you were refresh my memory, you were studying history and economics. Well, yeah, I, I studied uh, economics in college, but then when I went out into the real world, the only people that were hiring because there was a recession going on was uh, places like Walmart stores. So I did a, I, I became a, a manager trainee in a Walmart store, and then I had my own retail uh, store for a, a couple of years, uh, and I had a, a personal health crisis. And I went back to school, and that's when I was studying history because I was going to become a history teacher when a buddy of mine asked me to come aboard and help out temporarily at the ad agency. That was 28 years ago, 29 years ago. So, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, very and, serendipitous. And I, I, yeah, and I didn't I, – I got my first copywriting job just before I turned 30. So I was doing other things, you know, working in mm -hmm. sports, sports media, uh, media relations for a sports team, went back to graduate school and studied poetry. You know, it was, it was, I didn't have any training, you know, I, I learned by doing so. And now, now you've got, uh, your website is called Stuff About Advertising and you launched a TikTok page. Tell us about why, why TikTok? What, what's been so fun for you about TikTok? And what have you discovered about TikTok that helps you with your with your work with your business. Mm -hmm. um, I started TikTok in 2020. It was just you know the height of pandemic quarantine boredom, <laughs> um, and TikTok had just recently been changed over from Musically, which is what they were called before. Um, so it was it was really starting I to pick up. Um, I was always drawn to content, like I said, because I had a YouTube channel when I was a little bit younger and I just love creating, creating things, making videos, just having fun online. And I was so into TikTok in quarantine and I noticed that no one was talking about advertising. And that was kind of back when TikTok was the majority, it was trends where there would be some kind of format with a song or a, a piece of dialogue or something, and you would kind of put your own twist on it based on what your niche is. And so I did that with advertising. So I would take whatever trend was happening and make a joke about it that related to agency life or an ad campaign or something. Um, and that did really well. I found a group of people who really wanted to commiserate about agency life with me. But then on top of that, there were people in my, in my comments who were saying, I didn't know this was a job. And, and they'd say, oh, I, I saw this on Mad Men. I didn't realize I could do this. And so I started talking to them because that made me realize there's this whole audience of people who could be interested in this as a career, but they need some guidance and they need some education on what this career actually is and how to get into it. And since I didn't go to portfolio school, I kind of felt this kinship with them. And I, I wanted to take them under my wing and help them get into the industry kind of on their own. And so I just started creating educational content to teach copywriting and concepting and teach them about ad campaigns and how to analyze them and, you know, everything in between. And because of that, I found this incredible community of people who are so supportive and with this industry having issues with toxicity and inaccessibility, having this community just felt so right and so welcoming. So I wanted to keep working on that as much as possible. And then a incredible perk of all of that was finding connections for freelance work. I mean, I've gotten mm. so many of my freelance gigs have come from connections I've made through TikTok, which has been incredible. Wow. 
could you put up something on the screen that demonstrates some, something that maybe something recently that you posted? So Taco Bell just announced that their Cheez-It Tostada and Crunchwrap Supreme are gonna be available nationwide, but I wanna talk about how they announced this on Instagram. In classic drop style, they deleted their Instagram posts. Today, they started posting all of these pictures as a cheese takeover. Since the menu items feature these huge Cheez-Its, the images seem to be focusing on the same vibe. Big, grandiose, featuring the food items almost as if they're sculptures. And a lot of it gets kind of trippy. But if you take a look at the comments of any of these posts, you see a lot of people crying AI. Pay real artists to make art. Pay real artists to make art, not AI. Taco Bell not paying a real artist. But the thing is, they did pay artists and those artists are tagged in all these pictures. It's this 3D artist duo. And there are people going into those comments that are saying this is AI and responding and saying, actually the artist is tagged, this is just 3D art. But it seems like a lot of those people don't care or they don't believe that. And I was so fascinated by the comments immediate reaction to what they thought was AI. Like the sentiment around AI right now is so negative. People are ready to call it out and they are looking for it. And there were some people who were saying just because an artist was paid doesn't mean that the artist didn't use AI. And I don't know the ins and outs of legal contracts that go with brands and artists, but I would assume that there's a clause in there that makes sure the artist doesn't use AI. But I do feel like AI is going to become a totally normal tool for anyone to use. Just like computers and the internet and Photoshop and every other tool that came along at some point. So I wonder if rules and regulations are put in place to govern the use of AI. If they teach the AI models with work that was either volunteered or paid for, will that make it okay for brands and anyone else to use? Or does it still feel like it's not real and this person didn't actually make it? Like is AI forever tainted? It also makes me curious about 3D artists and how they're dealing with their work being called AI. But if I'm being honest, I can see why people might think this is AI. It has that same kind of uncanny, whimsical, futuristic vibe to it. And there are some like odd shapes and things that just don't make sense. But art's just weird sometimes. I'm curious to hear your opinions on all of that. I know AI is a super nuanced, touchy subject, but we can't ignore it forever. And also, I really want to crunch out now. So that one was really interesting. And I feel like it's a good example of, of what I talk about because um, a lot of people come to me for my opinions on the latest ad campaigns because I am honest. I'm Because I'm a freelancer, I'm not attached to an agency. So I have a little bit more freedom to say my honest opinions about things. And of course, I never am hateful or mean or or just you know negative for negative sake. I'm trying to analyze what's going on in the industry and what these campaigns mean for you know bigger creative perspectives. And AI has been a huge thing. And looking into these campaigns, reading the comments to see how people react to them, that's the kind of stuff that I really like to talk about. And I like to start conversations about these things. Um, so this was just a really interesting recent one that did spark a lot of conversation and it's been it's been really interesting. I'll say I mean there's a lot to unpack <laughs> in that in that clip of was three four minutes. Uh, Not was, even uh, probably two right like how long I think was it's it? two two and a half I think somewhere around there. Yeah I was I was close. Yeah, they've got, they've got, and and one of the things I mean I'm, all kinds of things are going through my head. <laughs> AI is clearly a hot topic today. We've yeah, had a couple it, of episodes talking about it. We've had mm -hmm. a couple of episodes talking about it, but from a different perspective, you know, it's interesting. This is now how many people are they're playing AI detective out there? Can we spot the, the AI? I took a quiz that was posted on either the Wall Street Journal, or the New York Times, with ten images asking me if I could tell the difference between AI and real, and I failed it utterly. <laughs> I, mean, I, I I called something AI when it was real, and I called something real when it was AI. It's like I just couldn't tell the difference. Now that was all with people images, not things. Mm. Um, but also I had a conversation with someone who, by the way, knows you. Uh, his his name, his first name is Shirag and I can't remember his last name, but he is a strategist in Dubai. I talked with him last night. We we're gonna try to get him on the show and he follows you. He knows who you are because mm. I told him that we were having this conversation today. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so, I mean, you're, you're, it's like, it's a, it's a tiny world. It's a, it's a tiny world. And he told me, he said, people today, and this is just a subset. I, I told you there's a lot to unpack with what you did. Mm -hmm. He said, some people don't even turn the volume on when they watch a TikTok. They just read the, the, the subtitles because they're either in an environment where they, where they don't have the, they don't have earbuds. They're in an environment where they don't want to disturb anybody else um, or both. And I found that fascinating. So 
everything's I captioned. Uh, everything is yeah. captioned. Yeah. And yeah. is that done automatically by does TikTok do that for you? You have to get a, 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 a plug in to do that. You, they do have the setting on there. Um, so you can turn it on and off as a, as a user, you can, there's a toggle where you can turn the captions on and off. The thing is, if you don't go the creator, if you don't go in and fix the captions, sometimes they can be pretty wonky. So they're, a lot they're of people- They're faulty as hell. Yeah. They are. I, one, of, one of the <laughs> things that I hate when I'm looking at any kind, I don't, I don't really consume a ton of content on TikTok, but even on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, uh, the I guess the short ones and the YouTube shorts, it's all kind of blending into the same thing, yeah. but they have like these really wonky captions and, and you know, I'm not a copywriter, I'm a, but I'm a strategist, so I kind of have to be a writer <laughs> and it bugs the hell out of me. I can imagine that as a copywriter, <laughs> you see like some of these things, like I saw one the other day that I think uh, the person said insolent and the thing said insulin, like yep. the medicine, <laughs> like, well, isn't there, some isn't of them there are like pretty a, funny. Yeah, there's a there's like a, a couple of videos out there where you're trying to guess what the song lyrics are, and they end up being just ridiculously off. Yep. Misheard fun, song lyrics. Misheard yeah. song, so it's like that. I mean, I haven't thought about adding subtitles or the mm -hmm. closed caption to our episodes. We we probably should, but it would be an, another step of work that we'd have to do, yeah. and Henry would probably have to do it. Um, <laughs> So no, we haven't done you. that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, thank you. Um, I got a full-time gig already. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But so let's go back and look at that. That was fascinating because it's, it's very topical. Um, and you are, you, I think your assessment, your self-assessment is, is spot on. You're not being judgmental. You're, you're calling out people who are playing detective and maybe making a mistake or not paying attention to what mm -hmm. was actually posted. Um, you mentioned to me when we had our pre-recording conversation that some of the comments that you get can be a little nasty. Yeah. Oh, is that still the case? Oh, yeah. Every day. I actually just went on a little venting session on my Instagram stories yesterday about it because it was a particularly rough day with the comments. Um, and of course, I, the majority of my followers and people who interact with me are absolutely lovely and are so supportive. And I got so many amazing messages just trying to pet me up and it was amazing. But That's I just, great. it's kind of sad, um, the state of the comment section online in general, but as a woman, especially. And I, mm. yesterday was talking about how I've noticed that while any creator will get mean comments, no matter who you are, how many followers you have, you will get mean comments if you make content and put it out online. That's just the nature of the beast. But when I compare myself and my my own comment section to that of male creators in marketing and advertising in that same space, they seem to have this automatic authority, whereas yeah. I have to really prove myself to get the respect and the trust. And it it's very frustrating, especially when that manifests in comments that are questioning me nitpicking every little word that I say in the video, telling me that I missed this one specific detail. And it just, it goes on and on. And it's very frustrating because, you know, I'm trying to make these videos as quick as possible, as engaging as possible. I'm not going to sit there and make a 10 minute video that goes through every nuance and detail. I'm going to say the most interesting stuff and get out of there. But the people in my comments are looking for those things that I missed or didn't say or said wrong or whatever it is. Um, and they don't hesitate to tell me about it. <laughs> here's my so. here's my here's my advice as an old man. Don't pay attention to any of it. Yeah. And I know that it's I know. I know it's easier said than done. Yeah. But you know, it's the old adage about you only can control the way you react to things. Mm -hmm. People are gonna they're there are assholes out there and they're looking for targets to be assholes too. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and they're going to go for the obvious thing. If it's that you're a woman, they're going to go for that. If it's that you're fat, it's, it's going to be that. If it's that you're what they're going to go after the obvious thing. And that's just the way they are. There's poison people out there. Mm -hmm. I would, uh, you know, from what I saw, and I only saw that one video that you just shared like Howard said, in two and a half minutes, you unpack a very complex issue, raise some very provocative and smart questions, um, and added to the conversation. 
that's, positively added. Yes, that's that's the most you could ask for in a, in a two and a half minute piece about about AI in advertising. So I say, go ahead and read comments because part of <laughs> obviously creating is interacting with followers and with mm-hmm. people that, but anybody who's just mean spiritedly, you know, now somebody's over, some people also aren't necessarily trying to be mean, but they might be overly critical. Yeah. And you also have to learn to recognize that too, that some people mm-hmm. are just pedantic and, and I, you know, I've, I've done that before, you know, like I, <laughs> you, you know, so just, yeah, I, I welcome different opinions. Like I am all about opening that, opening up that dialogue. And I constantly say that advertising is subjective and I remind people of that all the time. So while I am presenting my own personal opinions on things, I recognize that just because someone follows me doesn't mean they're going to agree with me. And that's fine. I am 100% okay with that. I want to have those conversations. I want to pick things apart. That's why I'm making these videos. Um, It's just those few comments that are just mean spirited for no reason. But the good thing is it just helps boost my video in the algorithm every time they comment something. Oh, 100%. 100%. (laughs) Yeah. That's part of it. Before I forget, I just want to say your website and your TikTok page is called Stuff About Advertising. We'll have a link when we do this episode. The other thing I want to say to echo what, what Henry said is that if if they ain't shooting at you, you're if if they're shooting at you, you're doing something right. You're over the mm-hmm. target. Yeah. If you're right. taking yeah. flack, you're over the target. Right, exactly. That's a good way of looking so, at it. Yeah. So <laughs> so we have all creatives in our business learn very early on that we have to have a thick skin because Mm -hmm. our ideas get challenged all the time. And when we forget that our ideas are being attacked and not, and we think it's us, then we freak out. But that's the thing is that on social media, the line gets crossed and it's not the idea that gets attacked. It's the person volunteering the idea that gets attacked. And sometimes in very nasty and personal ways, um, but that's kind of like an occupational hazard. If you're going to be an influencer, mm-hmm. you're going to be yeah. somebody with a lot of people watching you, um, somebody within, you know, with some degree of influence, sorry to be redundant. Um, <laughs> there are going to be negative Nellies out there that are, are, you know, tugging at your coattails. I like that mm-hmm. negative Nellies, you, you know, um, <laughs> you know, that um, one of the things that you mentioned, and Howard and I, I raised it on a prior episode where we were talking about AI and this isn't this, our episode today isn't about AI. It's about you and how you're using TikTok, And we need to get back to that in a second, but <laughs> I, just since the topic is, is there and you yeah. brought up some very provocative questions, I had the question, like I, I said, you know, when I was growing up, they used to say, everybody has a twin somewhere in the world. Like somebody looks exactly like you, right? Like, and it's like, it's, it was always kind of like a funny thing to think about. Like that there's, you know, there are people probably out there that look a lot like me. In fact, the other day in a, in a WhatsApp group, uh, somebody posted a, a picture of a guy sitting in a restaurant that looked very much like another one of the people in, in our group. And we were laughing about how much this guy who wasn't him looked like him. And I said, but what happens when AI creates a fake person that looks exactly like a real person because Mm -hmm. that likeness an image right it belongs to somebody even though it was created by ai if i could if i could go to a jury and say yeah but this is me it doesn't matter that a computer created it this is my likeness and image like they could sue maybe and get compensation so i think we're in a brave new world um regarding you know these things that are generated um training on you know a lot of open source imagery and stuff like that but eventually there's going to be you know one of those pictures is going to look like brad pitt not intending not Mm -hmm. with a prompt to say look like brad pitt but just because of the there's only so many variables and one of them is going to come out looking and brad pitt's going to say i didn't allow this you know so well you know what's interesting is uh, did you guys see the alexander wang instagram video just recently i heard about it just today it's something about um the the lookalikes so these are like like these are people that look somewhat like i looked at the pictures they don't look like them but they look they have a hint of of the yeah i've heard i've heard about the scarlett johansson controversy with (laughs) OpenAI. 
Yeah. You know, and I, I heard a 10 second clip of the voice they're claiming isn't, so it doesn't sound like Scarlett Johansson. And I said, any idiot can figure out that's Scarlett Johansson. 100%. And, and you know, it also prompted me to go back and watch that movie, Her, which I'd seen when it came out in 2013. I'd forgotten about it. It's a good movie. But yeah, that that is a, that is a, a critical issue. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, as Henry intimated a minute ago, I do want to we do want to get back to <laughs> your role on TikTok. Uh, this issue is huge. And you've, I think, addressed it really well. In the conversation that you and I had before we did this recording, you said that, and you hinted at it earlier, that it's a it's an underutilized space for creatives. And you have since been, you know, uh, since you started doing your posts on TikTok, have generated a lot of freelance business. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that. What kind of other creatives are you meeting and connecting with on TikTok? So I think until recently anyone else that was in this world it was more focused on marketing and i know that a lot of people don't really fully grasp the, the delineation between marketing and advertising but when you see the content it feels very different you know they're talking about building a brand they're talking about making facebook ads things that are slightly adjacent to the creative advertising world that i focus on um so I felt like I was the only one. I'm sure there was someone else around there, but they just weren't coming up on my feed. I was searching for people talking about advertising and it seemed to all be focused on marketing. Um, so it really felt like this untapped space. And I think the quick follower growth I had kind of reflected that because no, they weren't seeing it anywhere else. And they, like I said, they didn't know this was a career. They had never heard of it. They didn't know all this went into making an ad. They just had no idea. So it was really cool to be one of the few people to kind of open their eyes and teach them about this world that they were just so unfamiliar with unless they had watched Mad Men. <laughs> I'm smiling. <laughs> I, I'm smiling, Ashley, because we another one of our previous guests was Paul Taylor from Ad Week, W-E-A-K, yep. <laughs> who does all the parodies about the ad agency industry. And he had one recently that I saw that was something about agency launches new positioning about how they're not an ad agency. <laughs> yeah. And and that made me laugh. And while you were talking, I was laughing because I was thinking, of course, you didn't find anything about advertising because nobody wants to admit that they work in advertising anymore. <laughs> Everybody says that they're doing something different uh, and they're all just ad agencies. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, you look at a lot of ad agency websites these days and you can't make heads or tails of what it is that they do. They they, they do any, their their language is clear as mud. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what can you just come out and tell me what it is that you do rather than all this hyper <laughs> BS, it's bullshit is really what it is. Anyway. They're storytellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're, if they're storytellers, yeah, their website sucks. <laughs> Yeah, they say they say everything except what they actually do, which is yeah. create, create advertisements for money. <laughs> exactly. It's like, come on, don't don't talk about all this. You know, we leverage this and we 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 do that, and we. So we it's like, come on, just that's what happens when you have AI write your website. I, yeah, I suppose. I mean, <laughs> I, I have used I have used AI and it has helped, but it's because I know how to ask some prompts, and I'm not a prompt engineer, exactly. but I'm learning I'm learning how to do. It. But okay, so you have slowly but surely found some other creative creatives on your uh on your quest when you you post stuff on on tiktok and it's generated some business i uh, here's a, here's where we're going to bring this back to the creative brief are you would you say that the briefs that you get for your projects well, well let me just back up and say are the assignments that you get on your freelance work when people pitch you for for freelance work is it work to do on, on TikTok or is it a more general, I have a creative project for you to do that may or may not include TikTok? If it is TikTok, if it is other social media, is the creative brief what you expect it? Are you happy with the kind of brief that you're getting or does social media require a different kind of brief? Uh, lots of answers there. <laughs> um, I have worked on two separate TikTok specific briefs um, since I've been a freelancer. TikTok has always kind of been part of the, the media mix, but specifically, you know, just creating content or coming up with ideas for content for TikTok has happened twice. Uh, one time 
it was kind of, it felt almost like an afterthought from them. They just said, we need some ideas. Here's the brand go. <laughs> and I, that was kind of earlier on in the TikTok world. So I, I, I excuse them for not really having more yet because no one was really um, grasping what kind of lot, content. There are, there are to a do. lot of organizations that get briefs that are that bad. I mean, 30, yeah, 40 I, years yes. ago, they would get, you know, just, you know, just do something. Yes, so exactly. That's not unusual. <laughs> and that was, that was from an agency and I love them. I've worked with them again and they're great. Um, the other TikTok specific thing I've worked on was for a brand I was working in-house and, and I wish I could say this brand, but they kind of sent me this scary email when I was done working with them that said, you can't talk about it. Um, but it was a tech company and they basically just needed help building up their library of videos on TikTok. So I came in as sort of a consultant slash writer slash creative director. It was kind of a, a strange um, role, but I would basically come to them and say, here are the trends that are happening on TikTok, things that I think we can work with based on what products we're trying to push or what pillars of the brand we're trying to communicate. And I would write some video scripts for them or a caption, or um, if they had their content creator make the video, I would then edit it or tell them what to fix. Or, you know, it was kind of sort of a creative director role mixed with some, some copywriting and consulting. Their briefs were very corporate. I feel like is, is the word that comes to mind. They were very, very focused on the features of the products they wanted to focus on. They didn't really understand how to sell in an indirect way. They just thought we need to make a TikTok about this new product. Product is front and center. It's spinning around. It's cool. It looks high tech. We need to talk about these features. And me and the other people who were also freelancing were trying to continuously push them on yes, this can be the thought behind the content, but that's not what's going to work on TikTok. TikTok doesn't want to be sold to. They yeah. would just want to be entertained. They want to learn. They want to be engaged in some way. And product pushing is not going to do it unless you do it in a super fun way, which some brands have figured out. But this brand, they were just not ready for that kind of content. So it was a it was a, a struggle to get them. It was baby steps as we went to help them figure out what they needed to be focusing on. And, and the briefs were part of that, that baby step change. You know, we would get a brief that just said, here's the product. That was kind of the beginning. I then guess, I said, okay. I was going to say, I, I guess that in a way that's good news and bad news, right? It, it's, it's bad news because you would want for a marketer or an advertiser to be more with it, right? But mm -hmm. on the on the other side, the fact that they're not more with it provides an opportunity for somebody to guide them, right? And that's a right. that's where that's where you fit in, right? Is to say, okay, I get you. You guys are what you are, you know, HP or what? I don't know. I'm making it up, <laughs> but but this is how we're going to bring it into this world, which is a completely different world, and it has to have these type of elements to it in order mm -hmm. to succeed in this world. And so it, it creates an opportunity for you to be kind of a translator. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a job opportunity, I would, I would say. Um, and I, I think that's a fair amount, by the way, of what ad agencies and advertising people have always done, right? Like, you know, it's like, okay, so there's this great new medium called television. There's actually pictures with the, with <laughs> the, with the voices. What are we going to do? Oh, well, we'll have dancing cigarette cartons because people <laughs> love dancing. And, you know, and so somebody had to, you know, that didn't just, it wasn't automatically, uh, you know, come from the sky that there were going to be dancing cigarette cartons, you know, right. somebody uh, had to ideate that and say, you know what, people really like dance numbers. So let's, <laughs> let's do dancing cigarette cartons. So I think that's a, a fair element of what ad agencies and, and creative people, when they're at their best, have always been guiding clients and teaching them about the newest thing and how to better use it um, to, in furtherance of, of their brand. And mm -hmm. some agencies and creative people are really good at it and some are not so good at it and just kind of copy what they see everybody else doing. Right. Yeah. And they, they definitely loosened up. Like I think um, just 
showing them things constantly, just getting them to be immersed in the world of TikTok, they definitely caught on. Um, but it was a very slow process. And I'm sure a lot of corporate brands are kind of experiencing the same struggle. One of the, one of the, one of the, uh, the big challenges that I see, and I, I work at a traditional ad agency. Um, we're a small agency that's part of a big group, right? Like we're, we're part of WPP. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're part of a gigantic group. Um, and we work with blue chip, like big corporate clients. And one of the challenges that I see with all social media, not just TikTok, is it's a mindset shift from where they used to spend a million, a million and a half dollars on a piece of content, and it was all very professional and very glossy, and and you know, and you had a three month lead time and all this stuff. That's not this. This is handheld, shot with iPhone with those crazy captions that are, are messed up. And, and in a lot of cases, right? Like I'm not saying, I'm not saying that that's what, what brands should aspire to, but it's gotta be lower budget. It's gotta be quick turnaround. It's gotta be, um, you know, instantaneous. Like, you know, you, you can't, there can't be a trend today on TikTok and you come out with something three months later, you right. know, copy doing that. Like you gotta be able to jump. And I, and also the approval processes have to be a lot quicker and more responsive. So I, I think that those are big barriers for, especially for big clients. And what you, what, what you see a lot of times is that like small advertisers or like local shops and stuff like that, they don't have any of those taboos, right? Like they never had a million dollars to spend on a TV spot before. So they don't care that the production value, you know, that it was shot on an iPhone, you know, and it, it, so I, I, I think we're, we are in kind of a in-between stage where we're, everybody's still, despite the fact that social media has really been around um, as long as it has, we're still in the wild west of it. Like yeah. people trying well, to figure especially out. TikTok, especially TikTok, yeah. I, I'd say. I mean, one of the things that kind of crossed my mind, Ashley, is that a traditional brand brief uh, might be more valuable to you than a corporate brief. Because we already know, we, meaning your client, knows this is the avenue. This is the, this is the silo we're going to communicate in, TikTok. Mm -hmm. We have other silos. You know, we do email, we do direct mail, we do websites, and all these other things, some above the line, some below the line. So we've got a project. We want to get our message out on TikTok. And one of the things that I, I argue is that, well, you don't need a creative brief for, for a tactic. You need some kind of brand message so you know what the brand is. And then the automatic barrier that you're alluding to is, yeah, but you don't sell hard on TikTok. Yeah. It's just not, it's right. just not, but that's, work. but that's the other barrier, Howard, that you and I always talk about is that very few brands have their brand well-defined yes. in a way that everybody in the market, at least in the marketing organization, forget about the broader organization really understands the brand and could therefore create to it. Right. If right. you have mm -hmm. a very strong brand and some good guidelines, anybody, I guess, could that's good could create to those guidelines within any medium and say oh this is you know cool like let's let's bring this brand and this personality and this style into tiktok what would that look like because it's going to look different in, in tiktok than it might look on tv or on radio or in some other uh, traditional medium do you so i guess what my point was ashley have you rethought what a brief needs to look like from your perspective have you have you thought about maybe offering up a different template when, I mean, cause you're, cause you're offering advice when you do these TikTok yeah. videos, I'm going to guess that you're going to offer advice to your clients as well. In, mm -hmm. in addition to the advice that they're looking, they're paying you for, are you going <laughs> to help them write the kind of document that's going to help them communicate to you what they want from you? Is that, yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. I think considering how, like you're saying, how quick TikTok needs to move, I think it's better to just have some guidelines around who our brand is, what we're trying to say, what we want to use TikTok for, because I'm a big proponent of, of not having your brand say the same thing everywhere. And your voice doesn't have to sound exactly the same on every platform. So TikTok is going to have its own purpose and its own facet of the brand personality. So it's going to feel different from other stuff. So Figure that out. That's what should be in your brief is who are we on TikTok and what are we trying to 
get done there? Do we want to have a better relationship with our customers? Do we want people to know about this one very specific part of our company that we don't talk about anywhere else? Like, what is that thing? And then underneath that, all those individual videos, you don't need briefs for those. No, just, no. just make them. As long as they ladder up to that bigger purpose, then it's going to work. And if you trust the team that you have in place to make this content, you don't need to look so deeply at every little piece of content and have it go through the approval process and all of that, all of that. It just, it's not going to work. Oh, you're, but you are asking your clients to do some extra work here. They got it. You yes. Say, you want me to actually, I mean, Henry and I were just, we just mentioned this a second ago. You want me to really understand my brand? I got to explain my brand to you. <laughs> I can explain my product. People are really good at explaining their products, but explaining mm -hmm. their brands, they're just mute. They can't do it. It's, it's frightening. Yeah. And we, I've re, Henry and I have referred to our old buddies, Peter Paul von Wheeler and Matt Davies, who did a global survey. What's well, been two, three years now. It's been out yeah. for a while. They have a, an organization called Better Briefs. They're located in Sydney. And this survey talked to marketers and agencies about perceptions about the quality of the briefs that the agencies provide. I mean, the marketers provide to the agencies. And the gap, the gap of perception is grand canyon. The marketers think they're yeah. doing great and the agencies say these briefs mm -hmm. suck. Yeah. And, that, and, one and, of, and it was basically 90 to 10 was like yeah. the split. Like 90% of marketers feel their briefs are great and 10% of advertising agencies think their briefs are, are good. So yeah. it's, yeah, the one, it's and the one, the one, I mean, it's a 45 page document, but the one slide that really struck me was 60% of marketers admitted to using the creative brief or the creative process to figure out the strategy. We'll, we'll know the strategy yeah. when we see it. Yeah, the trial and Thanks. error. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll know it. I'll, I'll, I'll like it when I see it. Like, yeah. that's basically it. And my question always is, how do you write a brief? <laughs> whatever whatever your ideas on briefs are, how do you write one of those <sighs> documents if you don't know what your strategy is? Yeah. You know? uh, Ashley, um, one question. So you mentioned earlier you had this client and they wanted to basically fill out, they, they wanted to fill in their library of content. How like what's the importance of having like if you're a brand new advertiser on TikTok, you start your channel of having right away having a big library of content. Like what is it just that the algorithm's gonna find you easier, that you have a bigger footprint out there? Mm -hmm. Is it like what what's the rationale or or was that just something they came up with and you weren't necessarily on board with it? Like, but it sounded like it was like, well, we need to do this. We need to have, I don't yeah. know, 30, 30 videos um, before we can have some sort of, I guess, momentum. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think a library is super important because that's the, that's how you're going to get the follow. Because if the thing with TikTok and what makes it so different and great, in my opinion, is Anyone can go viral on the For You page. You don't have to have a certain number of followers. You don't have to make a certain kind of content. Literally someone with one follower could go viral. But when that person goes viral, people are going to click on their profile. And if they have one video or two they're videos, not, they're not going to follow. I have no reason to follow you, to stick around and see what you're going to make next because you're not making anything. So with brands especially, and if brands want to start doing paid advertising on TikTok, it's hugely important to have something on your page that people can engage with. And I think um, something that has worked really well for me is my content is very bingeable. So if something comes across on someone's For You page from me and they like what I have to say and they come to my page, I've got hundreds of videos they can go through. And it's funny because in my notifications, I actually see that happen. I see someone follow me and then I see their name show up liking 20 different videos right after the other. So I know they're just scrolling through my page, watching my videos because they like what I have to say, or they're learning something. So the same thing can be true for brands. If, if you can get someone to click on your page, you need to have something there to reward them for doing that. I think uh, a, a yeah. helpful hint, and that this is very useful, uh, I think for people who are going to be listening and watching this, um, is your content about advertising has basically a limitless scope right like you can mm -hmm. to your point you i could watch 20 of your videos and they're gonna they're gonna be 20 different topics within the world of advertising i think what ends up happening with marketers is that they end up being one trick or two trick ponies mm -hmm. right and nobody wants to see the same thing in a different kind of flavor 
every time, right? So I think that there's a lesson there about how to, yes, your product or your brand needs to be there, but how to create, put it in a way that doesn't feel like you're seeing the same message all the time, you know, um, finding new topics, being current with the topics that are going viral on, on TikTok, because there's different, also different styles of, of TikTok videos, right? Like, so, mm-hmm. and those styles go in and out of a favor, like, oh, somebody's doing this thing or this dance or this particular piece of sound is being used. Now we're going to try to do that and maybe entertain a little bit, but also make it spot brought to you by our brand or whatever. Right. But I think that that's a good lesson is to kind of like broaden the scope, right? Not to be so. I think the 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 fundamental challenge again with Square clients that don't really know what they're doing is that they basically want to run their advertising in TikTok, like re, mm-hmm. you know, reformat an existing ad and put it in TikTok. And that's not a TikTok. Right. And I think TikTok also allows you to be more prolific, whereas something like Instagram having this very curated aesthetic sort of feed was so, so important for brands. Like they, they wanted to see what their grid of nine last Instagram posts would look like. And they wanted it to be so on brand and perfect with TikTok. There's way less pressure about that. People will just make 10 videos a day if they want to, it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what they look like. And perfect is the opposite of what they're going for. In fact, the, the, the less, uh, the, 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 I don't want to say the worst production values, but the more casual the production values, there's an appeal to that. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, that spot that you showed, that, that post that you showed us, I would say that it was really well done. I think the production <laughs> values are really good, but it's deceiving because it looks haphazard. But I think that's deliberate. <laughs> but but well, we, we won't tell anybody that. We'll keep that <laughs> as, as a little secret. Okay. And and I don't know if that was intended or or it's it's because of this is this is easy for you to put together boom 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 or maybe a combination uh, yeah but it, it but it's it makes but it it's par for what you see on on tiktok it doesn't yeah. stand out mm-hmm. for being way glossier than what you see on tiktok or way inferior to what you i mean that's basically the level but you you mentioned something interesting about like the contrasting instagram and i i think that these things are historical as well because like i said instagram now has features that are very TikTok like, right? And Facebook has features that are very TikTok like, and mm-hmm. YouTube has. YouTube. So th- there's a convergence now in basically the type of of video, short video messaging that we're content that we're all consuming. But it's interesting because Instagram initially was a social media outlet for users, people, not brands, to post still images and they were curated right it was like oh i went on vacation this fascinating sunset and you only like put like your best stuff and you wanted it there on instagram so when brands got in they kind of were copying that aesthetic and that tiktok was always more about like hey this is me i'm a real person this is what i find funny or or this is how i prank my husband every day and whatever it is and very informal and more immediate right so it, mm-hmm. it's funny but you how, can also you, you can also these... do the 10 minute videos that's a that's a new yeah. relatively new feature it used to be you know just a 30 second or a, a 60 second or maybe a two minute video now you can do 10 minute uh, 10 minute mini documentary but that's why like i said they're all converging right before yeah. Yeah. you wanted to do yeah. 10 minutes you had to go on youtube and and do your 10 minutes right in mm-hmm. fact right. I remember initially, I think 10 minutes was the limit that you could have on a YouTube video, like when they first started, right? And now you watch full-length movies, full-length documentaries, comedy, right. um, specials, whatever. Uh, it, it, you could have videos that are six hours long. And it's like um, X, X, you know, used to be Twitter. It was, was it 140 characters? And now it's mm-hmm. two, 200 and something other. And, and you can do multiple yeah. you know multiple so, feeds so it's it's all it's all kind of it's being it's evolving so i said it's a wild west where yeah. yes it is. <laughs> so, so so ashley um talk to the talk to the young person or the anybody who's saying you know i haven't you know maybe even to an oldster like me and henry you know i i want to go on to to tiktok it's a little scary uh but i have something that might be fun to say what would your advice be how would we get started 
just make videos. <laughs> you you have to practice and you have to just get comfortable being on camera. That's something that I luckily already had because of doing YouTube videos in the past. So I'm very comfortable just talking to my camera like it's someone else. Um, that does take practice though. And you're not going to get good at it until you just make a bunch of videos. So just do it. Just post it. Don't keep it in your drafts. Just post it. TikTok especially is very, very welcoming for anyone making content, no matter what you look like, whether you've got a zit patch on your face or your hair is wet, you don't have makeup on, whatever. People don't care. It They just want to hear what you have to say. So just post what's the, it. What's, what's the learning curve to do some of the crazy things that you've done with your video editing? Honestly, it's not that bad. TikTok has some pretty good editing features in it. And again, it just takes practice. I I pretty much only use the green screen feature just because I like to keep my videos simple and I'm just, you know, saying, here's an ad, let's talk about it. So green screen is super, super helpful. And I don't have a green screen around me. Okay, it's just wait, all stop, in the so app. What is it? When you say green screen, what do you mean? Explain that to us. It's it's just a feature in TikTok. So when I go to record um, a video, it lets me select an image or a video that I want playing behind me. And it automatically cuts me yeah. out and does the green screen for me. I don't, like I said, I don't oh, have yeah. a, a, physical a physical green screen. Green screen yeah. 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 So it, it kind of does yeah. it. It's, it's, it's a little bit of AI. Helping you out sort a little of? bit. <laughs> ah, interesting. But it's okay. so it's it's honestly very easy once you get the hang of it. I it's funny because you know I'm I started in social media and I've always felt like I am so in tune with social media. But when I first started using TikTok, I felt very old because I had to Google how to do this. I could not figure it out in the beginning, but again, just doing it over and over again. Now it's let me so guess quick and easy. You watch some YouTube videos on how to do a TikTok video, huh? <laughs> Probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But yeah, and honestly, the other thing I would say is that there is a niche for everything on TikTok. Yeah. No matter what topic you want to talk about or thing you want to do, <laughs> there is an audience for it. So go for it. And there's there's people who mix paint in their videos. That's literally it. It's just mixing paint colors and people watch the crap out of it. <laughs> there are videos of people pushing glass bottles downstairs just to see how they break. Millions of followers. You can quite literally think? talk about anything and there will yeah. be people who want to hear about it. <laughs> well, Ashley Rutstein, whose website and TikTok page is called Stuff About Advertising. Thank you for sharing this opportunity, especially to advertising folks. It's a platform we're not using to the best uh, possible use. So thank you for shining a bright light on that, for doing such an amazing job and for joining us on the Brief Brothers. We, we're delighted to have you. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Ibach. And together, we're the Brief Brothers. Till next time. Bye-bye.